Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you and welcome to today's session where we'll be talking about the state of medical device interoperability in APEC. My name is Wei Min and I am from the community and brand team of SG Innovate. For those of you who do not know, SG Innovate is a deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our work also involves building a community of leaders, thinkers and doers to drive and scale up deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, medical technologies, quantum technologies and autonomous vehicles, just to name a few, for the benefit of the world and society. Today, together with uh, APEC Med, we present to you this webinar to address and share more on the challenges faced in APEC on the topic of medical device interoperability within the healthcare industry. With no further ado, allow me to pass the time to Roberta from APEC Med to say a few words before we kickstart the opening presentation and discussion. Roberta, please. Thank you very much, Wei Min. Um, so trying to uh, share my screen. Welcome everyone. Um, so very happy to be here today, first of all, and thank you very much for, to SG Innovate to, uh, for this uh, nice uh, webinar that we co-organized. So it's a pleasure from APEC Med to uh, to co-organize this uh, first initiative around interoperability. So this is part of the work that we at APACMED are doing around digital health. So it's a new committee that we recently launched a few months ago. Uh, we now have more than 30 companies from large multinational companies, SMEs and startups in the medical technology space. Um, we, are, we have two main objectives. So the first one is to create and share knowledge around digital health. And the second one is to advocate for regional policies that can enable and ease uh, digital health in our region. So as you see here, we are um, working on different areas. So uh, interoperability is of course one of them. We are also working on cybersecurity, reimbursement, regulatory, and more recently on COVID-19. And specifically on interoperability, we raise awareness for medical device interoperability and especially for the need of a unique set of standards to be used by all vendors in all countries. So it's a real pleasure for me today to have these fantastic speakers and moderator and um, so I will uh, uh, leave the floor to Adam Chi from HL7 uh, Singapore. Thank you very much. Hello, thanks Roberta. Um... Let me share my screen first. So, um, good morning, everyone. I presume all of us are in the same time zone. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, medical device interoperability. And uh, given the fact that I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to keep it very brief and very holistic. Um, and then we'll take any questions uh, we have after this. So, as mentioned, today, it's going to be on interoperability with a focus of MET device. I'm going to very briefly examine um, stakeholders' requirements, um, more of that actually in the panel, and also some of the common challenges um, encountered um, during the quest to achieve MET device interoperability. So I'm going to start off uh, with a very simple data flow illustration. You can see on, on the screen um, for the table uh, in, uh, in green, it actually illustrates a very generic X-ray procedure. It, it could be a chest X-ray, uh, you know, uh, for the limbs, extremities, etc. But it's very generic. It all starts off with um, patient registration, and from there you can see the corresponding um, system. Um, can I can I actually minimize this? You can actually see the corresponding systems. Um, uh, it could be your hospital information system, your radiology information system, depending on how your um, hospital is set up, and you can see the stakeholders. In this case, for patient registration, it's simple as a receptionist, and it goes on all the way to the actual distribution of the, the report that was done by the radiologist to the uh, clinical information systems, uh, it could be the EMR, for use by uh, physicians, primary care staff, et cetera. Now, in this entire data flow, you see that MET device interoperability actually covers only a very small portion. So if you illustrate it doing it genetically, 
during data creation all the way to data use, there's about four steps, very generically, very simple. So you create, you store, you send, and you use it. Sometimes you crunch the data, you manipulate it, you know, you do analysis and you store the data again. Mac device interoperability in, in most cases deals only with the creation of the data and storage of the data. And this is illustrated again in the um, table here. Now, the thing is, this is just for one procedure in one department in the same hospital. If you were to expand that um, in a real world setting where we will be sending information within the same hospital across different hospitals, and sometimes within a cluster, we call it a continuum of care, you can imagine the volume of data being created and sent across multiple, uh, multiple information systems uh, across the entire uh, continuum of care. So the bigger uh, your care system is, the more robust, the more data you actually have to send and somehow make sure that these, things, these data are being used interchangeably uh, in a coherent manner. And within the continuum of care, usually we will have to send them through some sort of information system. Now, a lot of people will assume that just because I have an electronic medical record for my setting, I should be able to send data. Now, that is not true. Uh, you should really have something what we call a health information exchange. Um, the point I'm trying to illustrate is when you're sending data, um, most people have this impression it's just like sending emails. It's, it's actually not, it's just not random sending. There must be controlled um, processes, terminologies, rules in place before you can actually share the data and use it uh, in a coherent manner. So that, that was just to illustrate you know, some of the processes that will take place uh, and where MAT device interoperability um, plays in the grand scheme of, uh, of things. Now we're going to talk a little bit about interoperability. Um, I have a very standard definition here taken from IEEE. It refers to, it, re, it defines interoperability as the ability for two or more systems to number one, exchange the information. Number two, uh, use the information that has been exchanged. Um, and this is the, the, the problem. A lot of times when we are, I talk to um, stakeholders, when we talk about interoperability, it says, yeah, you know, we're going to rip out existing systems and implant, implement the same solution so we can make sure that everyone, you know, every single um, clinical information system can actually understand each other. That's not really interoperability, right? You can think of it as a very twisted view, but it's really still proprietary in a sense. So true interoperability is using standards. Um, then you facilitate the exchange of information and the use of the information. Um, and in the domain of health informatics, there are holistically three levels of interoperability. There's actually more, uh, but given the, the um, limitation of time, we're going to just talk about the more important three. We have uh, physical interoperability, functional, also known as syntactical, and semantic interoperability. Now, physical interoperability uh, refers to the medium of connectivity or the physical connections. So in this case, it could be um, the actual physical medium that carries the data. So even something like wireless network because it carries the data. Um, there's also functional interoperability, which really refers to the structure of the communication. Uh, so making sure that you actually understand the words um, to a certain manner. You know, we are using English right now. So my physical interoperability is actually, well, my Bluetooth earpiece and uh, you know, the internet carrying my data across to you guys. My functional interoperability in this case is the fact that I'm using English uh, and you all should understand each other. Now, semantic interoperability refers to the meaning of communication the vocabulary, the dictionary, or the torsos. In other words, it means that whatever I'm saying, you interpret it as my intended uh, purpose. So let me just give you an example. If I were to say the word APPER, um, some of you guys in the audience without context, you might be thinking, hey, am I talking about APPER, the computer company? You know, or am I talking about a real APPER? But this is what semantic interoperability is about, is really making sure that whatever is being communicated 
come across as its intended uh, intention. Now, if you put this into the world of medicine and healthcare, <laughs> it starts to get a bit iffy because if you have physicians typing in um, their notes, the clinical diagnosis, one of you, and it's free text, there's one million and one ways you can actually describe something, right? And sometimes it becomes confusing for people to go in and take over the records and try to make sense of what's going on because the context is not there. So this is what we mean by semantic interoperability. Now the absence of semantic interoperability, uh, semantic interoperability results in exchange of data with no guarantees that it is understood by the receiving system. Again, if you have a human being um, reading those notes, chances are you have a good uh, um, interpretation. Sometimes you don't, that's why you call the guy, uh, but chances are you can, it takes time. But if you try to do analysis on those texts without structured form, without terminologies, this is where the problem is going to start uh, coming up. And the problems will include secondary uh, reuse of those data. You can't really do uh, analytics. And this is a common problem we have in a lot of places. Um, we talk about big data, but a lot of times the, um, these places, they have big, uh, huge repository of data that is not usable. They are not semantically uh, usable. So with that, let's take a look at things in tandem. Um, we have a game back on the screen, um, the table. We talk about the procedure, systems, stakeholders. Again, very simplistic, um, generic x-ray example. And this time I actually added in additional columns. So you see the process, you see where the data uh, stages, creation of the data storage, uh, sending, using the data, sending data, et cetera. And I've listed here some of the more common uh, standards you can actually use um, uh, to actually achieve the intended state. Or, so let's say you want to crumb uh, some create um, images, medical images. The de facto standard you're going to use is DICOM, right? Well, you can use a, a normal JPEG um, or, or TIFA if you want, but that's not really something that we encourage because you lose a lot of those functions, like including ability to control the luminance level, contrast, etc. So if you use health IT standards, these are some of the more common standards you'll see. And I've also listed down the interoperability level, uh, limiting it to the three basic function, uh, to a bit three basic level. Now, here's the thing. If you look at the interoperability level, you will find that this right here mentioned functional uh, and semantic, right? And what happened to the physical interoperability portion? Now, many times when we deal with um, medical devices, they, the, the layer where we talk about physical interoperability, they're usually IEEE standards. So you have your LAN standards, your wireless network standards, USB, Bluetooth, uh, NFC, etc. These are ISO approved standards, IEEE standards. So the chances of going wrong, when people say that, you know, I have a problem with medical device interoperability, that's actually very low because these are well-established standards that's not only used in, in healthcare, it's used everywhere. These are electronic uh, standards, okay? And when we talk about medical device interoperability, again, it really covers this uh, few portion. There are some unique circumstances where it goes beyond that, but uh, we go for the 90% you know, of the use cases we have. Um, so the creation of the data, if you end, when you look at this little box, second box, the longer one, you find that some of the standards here mentioned, DICOM, um, HR7, SNOM SCT, they are very, very established standards. Um, you can't really go too wrong as long as you know how to implement them. Which brings us uh, to the next problem, uh, the common barriers. Uh, when people say, look, I have problem into, uh, implementing standards to achieve med device interoperability. Now, contrary to popular beliefs, common challenges that we encounter during med device interoperability are not clinical or technical in, in nature. We do have some um, serious challenges when we go towards semantic interoperability, where terminologies uh, are used uh, and clinical workflow can be complex. But at this level of med device, it's actually seldom um, clinical or technical. So let's take a look at some of the 
common challenges that at least I have frequently encountered uh, in my job. So the first thing is actually knowledge, uh, a lack of knowledge from both the vendors and the hospitals. A lot of times uh, you go in and you know, the, 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 the company providing that knowledge, the local counterpart may not be as well trained. So they may not have that knowledge. So what sort of problem is it regarding? They may not know that a relevant standard exists or that a relevant version of the standard exists. Uh, sometimes I'll come across and say, oh, you know, um, certain version, this, we don't have a standard. And, and I'll say, yes, we do. We have um, X, Y, Z. So yeah, but it doesn't achieve the intended function. But that's not true. That's a version that came up and addressed that problem. But this particular knowledge has not been uh, passed down um, to the person who's trying to fix the problem. So that's, that's where an example of lack of knowledge. Or well, sometimes they have the knowledge, uh, or, or sometimes they have the knowledge, but not enough to actually implement or upgrade the standards effectively. Um, I don't know how many of you guys in the audience actually deal with standards on a regular basis. Um, it's actually pretty complicated. It's a full-time job. Uh, unfortunately, in the Asia-Pacific setting, I think other than Australia, I have not seen any countries where they have a, an army of a standards professional. And you really need that, um, like it or not. You, you may not agree, but it is how it is. You, you need expertise um, to implement this, uh, this thing. And of course, they don't keep track of standards and updates development. Uh, another more common problem I've seen is during the initial implementation and customization of standards. Uh, they've done it in a manner, it could be due to the limitations of workflow they, they were placed upon, limitation of budget, and sometimes uh, more often than not, uh, knowledge limitation, they structured the initial implementation in a way that doesn't leave room for growth. So it's a bad architecture. It's like you're building a house and you, you, you come up with a very limited architecture. You, you shouldn't be able to come back later and say that, you know, architects, you know, don't know how to build houses because look at, look at my house. It's built in a way that you can't actually upgrade it. It's not true. It's the initial architect. And for all the standards I list early on, uh, you can actually customize, localize um, those standards to a huge uh, degree. Of course, it's a flexibility that is, is great in many settings, but if you don't know what you're doing and take out parts that you would need in the future or even now, uh, then that's gonna be a big problem. Uh, there's also the problem of cost, and I see that a lot in Singapore as well, okay? Uh, number one is cost for the vendor side. Vendors don't want or they can't upgrade the software of the medical devices that they have sold. Um, chances are the device that uh, they have sold is no longer under support. So think about it. In this scenario, you have an ultrasound machine that you have used for 10 years. And workflow have changed, technology have changed. You can now do fancy stuff. But that 10 year old ultrasound machine doesn't support the technological function that you want, or it doesn't have the, the, the software that you want, because you know what? It's built 10 years ago. And then you say to the vendor, hey, I want to upgrade this. But you know, chances are not many people may want the same feature. So it doesn't justify the cost for the vendor to actually go back and upgrade the software. It's the same thing as your phone. You know, you don't get Android updates or I would say iOS updates every year for the next 20 years. They will ask you to buy new, new products. That's just how it is. Uh, so cost isn't justified. And another reason why sometimes even though it's possible, um, you must understand that medical device requires FDA testing. And if you actually do um, substantial changes to the software, the underlying software, the vendor actually has to send that you know, the whole thing back to FDA for real approval, that's gonna be a lot of cost. Some software settings may not fall under this jurisdiction, but if I come across a situation where this was the actual underlying reason, they don't say it, but when I press, I say, look, you know, whatever you give me is nonsense, it can't be done. This is Adam, it's gonna cost us a lot of money and who's gonna pay for it? I mean, if you guys are gonna pay for it, um, yeah, we do it. And the cost is usually not justifiable. Or it could be a situation where the vendor actually have upgraded software and parts that you can actually add on. Uh, but the hospital doesn't want to pay for it because they don't have the budget, it's not budgeted for, never imagined it to be so expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So again, licensing upgrade costs. 
or it boils back to the initial form where the initial setup for the uh, health informatics uh, health informatics architecture wasn't done properly and doesn't leave too much room for upgrade or its limitation into a certain sense. And to ratify everything in tandem is going to be too much. And this is the real reason you find a lot of um, um, settings, be it in, in various countries, hospitals, they actually replace uh, total solutions. It's, it's actually insane to in place, replace everything because you have workflow change management issue. If a, if a piece of solution can be upgraded to, to fix uh, existing problem, that's always the best way to do it because you don't have to do change management. They're comfortable with the uh, existing solution. And ripping out doesn't actually guarantee that you get everything you want. It's really a gamble. But you see that institutions still do it because the underlying problem is, you know, whatever they have in place just, just can't be upgraded anymore, can't be changed. It's actually better to rip it up. So these are two of the main points I want to share um, uh, for this morning, uh, given the lack of time. Uh, sometimes, well, at least to me, the problems I've seen is really due to knowledge and cost, not um, technology or clinical in nature. With that, I'll end my presentation. Um, close this. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Um, this will lead me to our next session, which is the panel discussion to explore what Adam has presented in more detail and for the panelists to share their real world experiences and observations on this topic. Before that, please uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ivy Tay. I'm the Global Managing Director of EIU Healthcare. And one of the key focus that EIU Healthcare has is actually in observing and also uh, really, really tracking and monitoring key trends, technology trends in that tech area. And of course, interoperability is one, one main uh, trend that has been happening across the medtech space. So uh, firstly, um, I'd like to thank SG Innovate and APEC Med for inviting me to be the moderator for today's uh, panel. As I mentioned, uh, we are gonna discuss and explore more of what the topic of today's discussion, uh, webinar is about, which is the state of medical device interoperability in Asia. Uh, I would also like to introduce um, the other panelists that will join, join in this uh, discussion in a moment. Before that, let me just uh, mention a couple of things. In Adam's opening presentation, um, he has shared that interoperability, um, especially in medical devices, have in, 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 a, in generally has encountered challenges in its implementation. Now, when these challenges are applied in the Asia context, the, the barriers can be even more stuck, especially when in Asia, where medical device installations, usage are widely disparate, it's very fragmented. This means a lot of brands, a lot of different types of systems, technologies, and of course, like what Adam mentioned, the lack of knowledge and expertise in a typical, typical Asian hospital setting makes implementation costly and execution very difficult. So with that in mind, the questions that we would like to explore with the panelists so that they could share with the audience today their views, observations, and experiences are on the current state of device interoperability in Asia. What are the key challenges and limitations uh, of interoperability in hospitals, both from a hospital clinician perspective, but and also industry perspective, but also not to neglect the patient point of view. And finally, what role the meta industry can play to address these key priorities and to enhance interoperability execution in hospitals. So joining me today, of course, is um, Adam, who's just joining in straight from the opening presentation. I've got also Dr. On Min Wu, who is the Deputy Chief Medical Informatics Officer of Tan Tok Seng Hospital. He also uh, is an active uh, clinical lecturer at both med, uh, School of Medicine in NUS and NTU. We've got uh, Danny Van Kestener, the Director of Systems uh, Center and System Solutions at Draco Singapore. Uh, Danny is also a member of the newly formed, what Rebecca mentioned, APEC Med Digital Health Community member. So before we start the panel discussion, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. I see a few questions popping up on the Q&A box already, but we'll like to keep the Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Uh, please do continue to type your questions in the chat box as we go along, uh, but please be patient and we'll address some of these questions later on. Okay, so let me start with 
uh, my first question. Now, in, as I mentioned in my, in my remarks earlier, implementing medical device interoperability in Asia is costly, it's time consuming, it's difficult, and it requires quite a bit of management will. Uh, why then should hospital embark on this change? Why is medical device interoperability important? I'd like to open this to all three panelists. Maybe perhaps let's start from the industry perspective. Danny? Sorry, Danny, I don't think we can hear you. It's either your mute or... It's okay now? Yes. Yeah, so uh, what we want to avoid is that we have some uh, mistakes, errors um, that we want to avoid on clinical decision support, on also um, having extended uh, reporting issues, uh, misunderstandings, as Adam also described. And we want to improve efficiency as well, uh, working on interoperability uh, between medical devices. So these are the main reasons we see why interoperability makes sense uh, between medical devices. Understand. What about from the clinical and hospital point of view, Dr. Ong? Thanks, Ivy. Thanks, uh, SG Innovate and then the EPMEC for the invitations. It's my honor to be here. So, you, you, first of all, I think uh, for the clinician, right, in the hospital setting, what is a patient safety is important, right? Patient safety and then how can we treat the patient effectively and efficiently? So, then they come with the so called medical informatics. So medical informatics has proven that to reduce the, the workload of the clinicians. And you can also argue that there are some, some part of the medical informatics cause a more workload to the, the controversially, uh, not the more heavy workload for the clinician because of the reporting. But we are live in the era of the data, right? So the data and then so that medical devices which can incorporate or interoperability into the health information system or medical informatics, then we can use the, the analysis of the data efficiently and the, hopefully with this, we can have the better patient care. For example, for those with the vital signs, right? The vital signs, if it's the, with the standards, uh, the so-called health messaging standards and then all the vital signs are imported into the, the so-called uh, medical information system, clinician can view the medical, the, the vital sign data with the less error because if the interoperable, device can give the information directly into the medical information system or medical record, then the, there is a risk of the, the so-called uh, reporting error by the human is reduced. So we can have adequately you know, to see that, okay, this patient has a fever and then somehow in the future with this interview and the, with the data analytics, we can help with the more automatic kind of, uh, uh, you know, meaningful use of the data in the future. Got it, thank you, Dr. Ong. Now, Adam, you mentioned in your presentation earlier that, um, of course, with a lot of healthcare delivery systems shifting, even in Asia itself as well, towards a integrated care model or a continuum care model, uh, which is much more coordinated, which needs to be much more co coordinated across all care settings, beyond just the acute hospital setting, also in primary home care, et cetera. Um, and you alluded earlier that interoperability plays a crucial role for this shift to be successful. What have you observed so far? Have you seen any actual success stories in interoperability actually playing a key role in, um, in ensuring that an integrated care model can be fully applied in the healthcare system? Actually, I have. Um, um, to, to, to put that into perspective, I've seen projects that have been very effective but when you put it in the grand scheme of things, um, they are limited. They're always si in, in silos uh, due to the disparate stakeholders. So um, the technology is there. And if you actually implement the project properly, you start with clinical work, you understand what you want um, from the various parties, what is the intended, um, 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 ob or the intended objective. And then you implement the standards, the technology, whatever you, it really does work uh, in many, many instances. But the problem is um, a lot of times everyone is doing this in, in silos. So you have, um, because as Dr. Ang said, you know, um, uh, there will be physicians who, who find extra work. Uh, there will be physicians like him who are, who's actually very interested in doing this type of work. I, I don't think he gets extra pay for this. <laughs> it's, uh, I always look at physicians who 
um, do informatics and I says, you know, you could have a crushy life, but you know, welcome to the trench. Um, you know, gets coding for nothing. Um, so you get these disparate stakeholders. Some of them are willing to, to go on and, and try and, and resuscitate, but these are very small pockets. Of course, these pockets may add them up. It looks interesting, it looks exciting, but these are still many silo pockets of success stories that they're not talking to each other. So they're not talking back to the main systems. Um, and, and this would be a problem. So this is where the uh, the illusion of success comes. If you have a lot of conferences, uh, press studies, you talk, oh, you know, we're, we're doing this, we're doing that. But you go down for site visit and you ask the correct questions, you find out that yes, someone managed to transform a certain piece of the workflow in a hospital or in, in, in a community of care, but that's just one piece of the workflow. So, so to, that's the long answer to, to, to your question. The short answer is yes, I have. <laughs> But still a long way to go is what you're saying, Adam, right? Um, it really depends. Um, hmm. So if we have stakeholders involved um, who actually understands and, um, and, and is willing to, to go forth and do this, um, it can be a very short journey. Um, I mean, we, we have seen technology can be implemented really, really fast. Um, but you know, stakeholders have to be convinced to use them. I mean, you can put it there and they don't use it. It's, it's not going to be of any use. And it's actually worse for change management later on. Um, and then, yeah, so it could be a long journey. It could be short, but you know, the, the, the key, I guess, is really educating people and doing a mindset change. Once people, uh, and, and I honestly believe that whoever, well, everybody here, we're working in healthcare, right? Healthcare is not the best paying industry. We are here for a reason. And if you convince them that uh, there is a real uh, need for this, it's not just that we want to, if I would use a local word, the gun you, I don't want to make things, no, I'm, I'm not twisted. <laughs> I'm here to do something that's actually beneficial. And once they see that perspective, and this is from my experience, once they see that like this, aha, so this guy is actually trying to do this, then it goes forth. It's, not, it's a lot easier. Yeah, because I've done projects where we budgeted for five years and we managed to do it in three. And then I found myself suddenly out of a job. I was like, okay, that was a success, but okay. Yeah. Thanks for that, sharing that, Adam. Now, Danny, um, Adam has mentioned that there's a lot of uh, disparity in understanding and also gaps in understanding the standards uh, uh, for to ensure that interoperability can be fully executed. So uh, what are the interoperable standards that are currently be use, be, being used in hospitals for medical devices in Asia currently? Well, so far, everyone is talking about HL7 and DICOM, uh, but it doesn't allow really to have uh, interoperability between medical devices. It's good for communication and interoperability to uh, hospital IT systems. And we see that all companies are still using proprietary protocols and using a kind of bridge or gateway to communicate with hospital information systems. But when it comes to interoperability between these medical devices, there is not really a standard. And we see also limitations in the data that it has been uh, transferred from one device to another device. And if you want to use this data, we need to be sure that this data that we are sending to another device is secure data that we are talking about the right data from the right device from the right patient. So that's why um, we are looking into new standards able to have bi-directional communication as well and to remotely control and all, all, all go to automation as well between medical devices. So this, this is something that we are missing at this moment in, in the Asian healthcare industry or in the hospitals. Okay, thanks for that, Danny. Um, now, everyone can avoid the elephant in the room, which is COVID-19 outbreak and the pandemic that's raging across the world right now. Now, we know that the benefit of medical device interoperability would help the medical systems and the hospitals achieve greater efficiencies and also more importantly, reduce preventable errors. So in this period where we are, you know, a lot of hospitals are facing a lot of pressure and stress from COVID-19, both acute and also post-acute care, how has interoperability in your view 
come into play as part of, of, of the effort of hospitals to manage the care delivery during this pandemic? Maybe let's start with Dr. Ong on that. Uh, thanks, Ivy. So you look at the current uh, COVID-19 situation, right? So, you know, the healthcare facility is a limit, limitations, right? With the number of the cases. So in the first one, in the hospital setting, right? The number of beds for those to care for the patient is uh, limited, right? So then the, now with the implementation of the, the, the care facilities outside the hospital settings, right? So for those patients who are being uh, care there, probably perhaps with the all the pharmaceutical vital signs monitoring, like I mentioned earlier. So if these vital signs can be uh, monitored remotely, and then also feedback from the clinicians from the remotely, it might perhaps, and then some, some of course will be an automation like uh, Danny has mentioned, with the, some of the alarm system, right? Okay, these patients need uh, immediate care, and then how can we communicate to the, the, the care provider at the settings, all these things will be play an important role, especially in this pandemic uh, era, the, the situation, because the, you know, the healthcare, healthcare uh, is very, uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, affected in terms of the manpower uh, during the, the pandemics. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ong. But what about Adam and Danny from an industry perspective or an industry view uh, with the COVID-19 um, crisis right now? Have you, do you see the future of medical device interoperability change? There's more urgency to actually implement, to execute more will from the hospital management to see this through? Yeah, absolutely. We see, um, especially now uh, with the COVID-19 situation, we see a uh, huge um, increase in demand for uh, solutions for isolation rooms, where uh, we try to avoid that the medical staff needs to go inside the isolation rooms for changing settings on a monitor, on a ventilator, on infusion pumps. And this kind of interoperability will allow, for example, that uh, nurses or uh, doctors can change the settings from the device from outside the isolation room. And this is a perfect example of interoperability where we are using uh, new standards to be able to remotely control devices, but also also do alarm uh, distribution and to have confirmed alarm um, distribution systems, which is also a new uh, protocol coming up using the new standards as well. So we see a lot of um, increased demand and, and needs uh, to help uh, hospitals to, to keep their staff safe, but also keep the patients safe, of course. Great. Um, Adam, I see you nodding away. Do you see the yeah. same thing and you see the yeah, same demand? Pretty much the yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, great. Um, now, moving on to talking about a little bit of the future and, and the limitations of, of how interoperability could realistically uh, be developed in Asian hospitals. Now, maybe, Danny, since you were saying, you've been in the industry, particularly in medical device, for over 30 years, right? What have you seen are the key technical and clinical issues hospital professionals are facing in their daily work? And which are, which are the ones that you say are the key priorities to solve? Well, as, as Adam also explained, um, so many parties are still working in silos. And, and when we started, um, when I started more than 30 years ago, um, we started already talking about HL7 and then hospitals, um, IT departments were not really established. And so we needed to work together with IT, uh, IT companies. They never heard about HL7 at that time. So we needed to teach them uh, what is HL7 and to find a kind of um, common language um, to communicate uh, with each other. And, and we very often saw also in the past that we were using interface engines in the hospital to translate from one protocol to another protocol. And um, very much, very many countries and also hospitals and companies are still using these interface engines, which makes us dependent from, from um, let's say from third parties, which is makes it more complex also for IT um, departments in the hospital to manage as well. So we see actually um, a, a huge landscape of different protocols 
all trying to translate their own protocol into HL7, for example, and it's very difficult to manage for IT management in the hospital. So it's, it's getting very complex and also implementation is, is very complex as well. So, um, I mean, being, having silos has been a key theme that comes up as the challenges. I mean, it's, it, it, it is not, um, not, not unique to just a particular hospitals, but across the healthcare systems. What have you personally observed from a healthcare professional perspective, right? What are your highest priorities to be solved in terms of the challenges that you face in your daily work? I think we should go to um, a standardized protocol. Um, so HL7 will remain, probably we will go to FHIR, uh, which is seen more as a more secure way to communicate as well. Um, but um, for communication between medical devices, HL7 is, is not about live data. So we need to have an alignment between the different industries, hospitals, clinics, research insti institutes, and uh, official bodies like IEEE, IHE, or ISO can help to have this um, to help uh, to make this as a standard, as a, as a standard um, accepted worldwide. And of course, forums like uh, APEC Med now um, also help to create this awareness between the different parties. So I don't mean only the suppliers, but also hospitals. And of course, if we are changing, we will exchange data. Technically, a lot is possible, but it should also be clinical relevant. And of course, we need to understand also the, the medical needs or the needs from the hospitals and the physicians to make it relevant, to keep it relevant as well. That, that brings me nicely to ask uh, Dr. Anders' question. What are the medical needs and the medical priorities for clinicians uh, in, in terms of what, you know, Danny has mentioned that could, that could help uh, industry and you know players within interoperability prioritize how they should help the medical professionals. Yeah, thanks, Ivy. Yeah, so I think that Danny has uh, clearly mentioned about the standards, right? So first of all, we need to talk in the same language. So is interoperability is a is a the, what is a interoperability the meaningful is the is a, you're talking in the same language, right? The healthcare data should be in the the. the corresponding to each other in the how to transform the, the data into the meaningful and effectively in the care transformation, right? So this is an important point uh, for, for the clinicians. So first of all, we need to make sure that the data transfer to the data is so-called meaningful use in the patient care. The second is that we need to work together. We cannot work in, as Adam has mentioned, that we cannot work silo. So first of all, for the device companies, as well as a clinician, what is the clinical needs? Because in the healthcare setting, it's a patient as a first, right? So what we need for the patients, what we need for the better patient care. So the main objective is very clear. Better patient care, patient safety is important. So these are the things we need to work on it. And how can we uh, operate uh, you know, safely and efficiently in that manner? So in, in for my opinion is that, uh, you know, first, the change management. We need to standardize the, how the device talk to each other together with the EMR systems. The second, we also need to be to sort of standardization of the workflows in the patient care. So in terms that easily to so-called interoperable will be easier, right? Because one hospital, one clinic use a different workflow and the other hospital, the, the other uh, clinic use a different workflows. That will be very difficult in the protocolizing the, the, the issue so that in terms that the, the needs for each uh, hospital will be arrived the derive from that and then it will make things more difficult to to, to standardize. That's my personal opinion. Mm, mm. You, you mentioned many times that, uh, the importance of the patient safety, patient privacy, data security, etc. So from the from the views of the uh, Adam and, and Danny, um, what are the priorities that industry players and uh, when they're thinking about medical device interoperability place on these on the importance of patient safety and patient and data security and what are industry players doing about that? 
So one, one point we are looking at, and which is a pain for uh, all the hospitals worldwide, is, for example, alarm fatigue. So, um, and at the same time, it's also about missing important alarms by the medical staff. So talking about COVID-19, where we see a huge increase in the use of isolation rooms, uh, from vital monitors, it's most of the times it's not a problem because they are all in a network. They have a central station at a nurse desk. But talking about ventilators and uh, infusion pumps, for example, used by the patient, close to the patient, well, the alarms don't go outside the isolation room. So the alarms will only sound inside the isolation room where the patient is and not where the caregiver is always. So, at it, so if we can distribute these alarms outside the isolation room to the nurse, and to the caregiver, it will be safer for the patient. And at the same time, it will reduce also alarm fatigue for the patient itself. For the patient, it will be more comfortable to have not all the alarms beside him because he doesn't know, he doesn't need to know if a device is going into an alarm. Um, it's, it's the caregiver who should be aware about alarms. And then, of course, we need to filter also that we only distribute relevant alarms. So we need to go for smart alarms as well, uh, looking at different devices at the same time to see if one device is going in an alarm situation, is this relevant or other parameters from other devices also going in the same direction to create this uh, smart alarms. And that's why this interoperability will have a place as well to increase patient safety, but also to increase uh, staff satisfaction from the in the hospital as well. Adam, what about the perspective of data security? I mean, with interoperability, we see a lot of uh, information, patient data, especially being exchanged and shared. Um, mm -hmm. Aside from just having standards to ensure that communications currently that focus, standards that could focus on data communication between devices, what are the industry doing in terms of data security to ensure, you know, there is no risk of interoperability being seen as a leakage, uh, as a potential leakage uh, risk of patient data. Okay, so disclaimer, security is a very big field. So when you talk about security in this setting, if you're going to just isolate it to medical device interoperability, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it's actually really just network security. So that is not so you, you have to adjust the perspective that is not a med device interoperability issue. It's the network that happens mm. to house the medical devices. So it may seem related and you start, you know, asking the med device companies to, to, to do something. They could encrypt um, the data. It's actually easy, but you should really focus on the network itself, which is separated from the medical device um, providers, unless they're the one providing you the network and you can secure it. Um, these days, it's actually a lot uh, better in the hospitals. I used to be, 15 years ago, I used to be able to walk in any hospitals and see a network port, the RJ45 cable, and I will just plug in a cable, I can see the data flowing out. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true, and I will tell people, you know, and, and, but, yeah, <laughs> when I go for conferences and presentations uh, in the hospital, they invite me, and I ask them, so I can just stick my USB in? This is, yeah. So is this connected to the network? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but these days, it's a lot better. Um, you know, the, 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 the knowledge and awareness has come out. Um, but to answer your question, it's, it's not that we don't have, it's, it's, I'm not saying that med device companies don't have to deal with security aspects of things. But mm. in reality, most of the bridges are on the network layer of things or the human layer uh, components of things. Because once you leave the medical device realm, you create, you send, uh, store data. It goes to the hospital information systems. It's actually more or less uh, bad access. People who don't have access to it uh, somehow gain access to it. People who have access to it leak it out to um, other folks who are not supposed to have it. And that's the privacy portion. If you talk about you know um, hackers running denial of service and what have you, if you really go back to the root cause, it's still a network problem. It's not really the EMR problem. It's not the Mac device problem. It's, it's a network security problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Um, I'd like to, of course, leave some time for the audience to also ask questions to the panelists. Therefore, maybe my last question to all three of you is to talk about the future risk of interoperability and, and share with us what uh, the medtech industry, uh, in collaboration with hospitals, with uh, key advocates like Dr. Ong, 
can do to be prepared to mitigate this risk that would happen. So perhaps uh, maybe start with you, Adam. What are the future risks that you see? Um, no real future risk. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You don't implement <laughs> it and it gets worse. I mean, the standards are already there, existing. Um, so you just have to use it and improve onto it. So there's no real risk. Again, it's knowledge and um, 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 cost. A lot of times, you, 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 at least for me, when I talk to stakeholders, it's not that, you know, people have this impression that, oh, these guys are not doing enough to, um, to, to get what we want. But it's, it's not true. They are trying their best. It's that sometimes they don't know that there may be a better way to, to do it. Uh, because most of these guys are IT, IT guys. They come in and do it, try to do it the IT way, you know, which mm. in my case, not really how it works. We use a lot of technology, uh, but that just doesn't mean that you know, we don't have something that's unique to us. So if you go and talk to a typical IT guy and say, hey, we use Snowmat CT. Chances are the guy have never never heard of it. We use Diacom. What the heck is that? Uh, you only use it in healthcare. Uh, there, there are complexity associated with it. Um, so a lot of times it's really um, just when you have um, people coming together, you have, you know, you know what you, you want, where you want to go and you equip yourself with whatever you have to do it. It, it can only get better. Yeah. Danny, your view? Well, there is there is one dimension uh, that we should look at as, as a med tech uh, industry is about um, how secure is the data that we are uh, sending to the mm. medical devices and receiving from medical devices. We need to be sure that we're sending out the, the, uh, the data to the right device uh, from the right device, receiving the data as well. And so additionally to the network security, we also looking to the, let's say the um, medical grade data where we want to uh, use certificates on the medical devices using whitelists and to do peer-to-peer -peer communication, encrypted communication. So that's why um, uh, IEEE has uh, published last year in January a new standard which is called Service Oriented Device Connectivity, so SDC. It's called IEEE 11073 Standards Family SDC, which allows to have secure communication between medical devices uh, to use the data for interoperability and to exchange data and to allow remote control and automation. So this is, this is something um, that not only one company can work on. So a lot of companies, more than 50 companies, clinics, research institutes have worked on this new standard and it has been approved by IEEE last year and also by ISO. And recently IHE has published a white paper uh, intended for um, research units and for developers and integrators to implement this new standard in new applications in the medical devices. So I would recommend everyone uh, involved to have a look on this new standard. So it is uh, really, so more and more companies are implementing this new standard as well. Um, mm. And it will um, allow a secure data exchange between medical devices. But however, we will still use HL7 and FHIR and DICOM to communicate with uh, IT hospital IT systems. Final comment from you, uh, Dr. Ong, on the risk of fu uh, future risk of interoperability, especially from the experience of actually implementing it within, within hospitals and at the execution of, of it. Yeah, thanks, Ivy. Yeah, so I think Danny and Adam has mentioned that, you know, the security, that security, secure connectivity is very important because once the, the connectivity is not secure, the, the this patient data will leak and the patient can be manipulated. So into the, the EMR system, you know, to go to the, the, our, the, the device system as well, right? So I think secure connectivity is the most important uh, part to be, uh, to be addressed for the future. Once you have, because in the era of the connectivity, right, once you are connected to the internet, there is a high risk that the data can be leaked, data can be breached, and then the patient safety can be compromised even because somebody altered the, you know, the, the functionality, right? So that let's say Danny was talking about the remote controlling, right? So once the, somebody can connect the connectivity into that, the patient setting can be more, the, can be uh, the attack in that sense. The second thing I would like to highlight uh, before the ending the, the comment is that uh, you know we need to work together the industry 
together with the healthcare uh, provider and then also the standards and governance. All these work, we need to work together as a team. So, for example, that's why the role of the clinical informatics is rising. And then I'm part of the clinical informatics teams, even though I'm a uh, surgeon by training. I still part of my time in the you know the to help with the clinical informatics. So these are the few things we need to work together as a team. So for those clinicians who, who understanding the what the clinical needs, and then also part of the knowledge on the clinical informatics part of you, and then see how can we uh, derive and then the deliver the you know, the higher standard of the, the interoperability in the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Um, as you were closing off your, your views about uh, the risk, and I was scrolling down the questions that's popping up on the Q&A box, uh, your comment about the collaboration that's needed between industry, between hospitals, between uh, 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 governance groups is, is very apt because that's what the audience wants to find out as well. Uh, one of the questions, two of the questions that's quite similar is asking, is there any industrial special interest group that is steering the convergence and bridging these uh, gaps within interoperability now? I guess um, any examples you can give about in Singapore as well as in Asia Pacific would be, uh, are the questions that the audience is asking. Actually, there's lots. So if you just look at Singapore, mm -hmm. um, Enterprise Singapore um, have actually they are actually a representation to um, ISO. So there are work groups under um, uh, Enterprise Singapore that actually looks at this, um, sometimes in, in different areas, but they do cover medical devices. Uh, and of course they cover the other spectrum of digital health as well. Um, HR7 is in Singapore in the region. Um, IHE is not in Singapore, but um, they are available in the region as well. Uh, so there are many, many different um, professional bodies that looks at standards. And you may be wondering why there's so many because it's a complex field. We have many, many different standards. You, you don't have one standard for everything. It's not feasible. Um, so, so there are um, uh, avenues where you can actually explore this. But a lot of times when I get people says, hey, you know, do you, is there a group that I can um, join? Uh, I'll say yes, and when they come, they are sorely disappointed because they will be finding that they are entering a work group where we are developing standards, and they'll be like, okay, I don't have time for this. I just want to use the standards. So you have to be clear what you want. I mean, we can invite you. <laughs> it's just going to be boring for you. <laughs> Got it. Um, I guess, therefore, that's why the couple of questions came up uh, on the Q&A boxes about um, who should lead this? Is there a suitable, you know, main one of the questions is asking whether uh, there's a main driver, there should be a main driver for, for this effort, you know, who's the main governance body, etc. cetera. So um, what, what are your views? Uh, maybe uh, Danny and Dr. Ong can start. Yeah, so we see a lot of uh, conferences worldwide. Um, so for example, HIMSS, uh, APEC as well. And we also see the drive, especially from IEEE, but also ISO and, and IHE. Uh, about um, driving and promoting standards. And so there is a consortium which was started a few years ago in Europe, in Germany, which is called OR.net. And this group is working um, together with hospitals on development, the development of interoperability. Now it all started in the OR, in the operating room, but it's ex extended now to interoperability in the hospitals between medical devices. And they have a lot of uh, nice use cases and I can share also the, their website. Um, and so they also able to help to implement uh, the new standards as well and to guide you. So this OR.net started in, in a few years ago in, in, in Germany, but now they extended to be a worldwide represented as well. So it's a, it's a young organization and it's more than 50 partners are participating. So uh, medical tech industries, hospitals, clinics, uh, research units, uh, all these things. So that's, that's really a drive now to create mm. this awareness. Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, the audience about the panel's view on the role of interoperability in the outpatient setting versus the inpatient setting. Um, perhaps maybe uh, from the clinician perspective, uh, Dr. Ong, if, if you can take this question. 
Sure, means the outpatient means in the hospital setting or in the so-called clinic settings. Uh, I need to. I assume I assume it means uh, clinical clinic setting community community primary primary clinic. Yeah, so for com yeah, so for community settings, right? So first of all, obviously, you need to look at the either it's a private sectors or the polyclinic sectors, right? So mm. polyclinic is a part of the cluster system, right? So we are interoperable in terms of the the the, the EMR perspective or EHR perspective, right? So under the MOH uh, MOH, uh, the the new uh, generation the EMR record system, so they are interoperable. So for the, I think device interoperability is uh, as far as the device data is into that uh, mm. EMR system is a the, the interoperability exchange, HIE is already there. So for the private sectors, for the private clinic, right, there are still not much of the interoperable at the moment. But I think government has already initiated on the interoperability in between the private clinics together with the 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 private sector and public sector together into the common platform like an NEHR health hub. They are trying to achieve the, the interoperable or sharing of the information between the private and public sectors at the moment. Mm, okay. I don't want to leave out uh, the questions, but I know we are running probably close to time already. Maybe just one last question that I'm seeing on the box here. Uh, the question is asking, there is a surging demand of telehealth devices due to the COVID situation. So are there any consider considerations in clinical informatics and regulations for integrating of tel telehealth devices? That's really a policy question, isn't it? Hmm. So, and, um, your views about this, about this, have you seen any policies or, or any considerations so far? I think Singapore does have um, guidelines. The Ministry of Health does release guidelines for um, telehealth, not mistaken. Uh, Dr. Al, do you know? You're, you're on mute. So, you're sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay, yes, uh, we have a telehealth, uh, the, the guidelines for the, from the ministry. So for recently, I think we have started on the some uh, accreditation in the certification for the how to safely conduct the telecommunications and the teleconsultations mm -hmm. on the telehealth platform. Yeah, correct. So there is in place, yeah. but I think it's not uh, widely uh, implemented across yet. Yeah. So the MOH has already started on the sandbox and the telehealth, and so as uh, some certification course for the the polyclinic doctors as well as the GPs. I just took the one on the, you know, the safety guideline, how to conduct telling consultations safely. And then the, all those uh, important things are quicks during the course. And then the, they will issue the certificate. Got it. Thanks for answering that question, uh, Dr. Ong. Um, I guess we are running on time already. And I know that uh, um, the there's a couple more questions that that we probably don't have the time to answer all of it. But as uh, Wei Ming mentioned in the, in the initial introduction, the uh, discussion of the panel is recorded. So is uh, uh, Adam's presentation today. So, and of course, uh, on the chat box, I've seen a lot of people also sharing their LinkedIn contacts, Adam as well. So anything else in more, in more detail that like connect with the panelists, please you know, do so uh, because they've shared their contacts with, with all of you. And on my side, I'd like to thank again SG Innovate. I'd like to thank the panelists for their very invaluable insights and, of course, very candid discussion about what they what their experiences and shared with everyone. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to attend today's uh, session. I'll pass it on to Wei Ming. Okay, so thank you, Ivy, for the wonderful moderating of the session as well as for the speakers. So uh, I think we have come to the end of uh, our webinar. So thank you everyone for joining us so far. And uh, we will just end it here. But before that, perhaps maybe I would like to have a picture with uh, all our speakers over here uh, to commemorate this, this particular uh, session. So can I just, just trouble everyone to just do a quick wave in front of uh, your screen so that we can just take a picture. <laughs> Yes, and yeah.
So yes, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Roberta, do you have anything to add on to say before we uh, end this session? Uh, just a big thank you to, uh, to all of you for this interesting in uh, discussion about interoperability. And we hope to collaborating with you in the future because we just started this new work stream on medical device interoperability with APACMED members. So we will have a lot of new uh, events and contents in the future. So really uh, thanks so much and looking forward to, to, to collaborating with all of you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, bye -bye. You. thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Goodbye.